start us off slow to give those people time to join us. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with you. My name is Sarah Rosengartner. I'm affiliated with the Global Center for Climate Mobility that is co-hosting this event with our Africa Climate Mobility Initiative and specifically the newly formed Knowledge Network of the Africa Climate Mobility Initiative, which is led by Dr. Nick Simpson, who you will hear from today. Um, we have interpretation available for those who join us and would like to follow the meeting in French. You can do this uh, when you click the interpretation button. And this is a reminder then also to all our speakers to speak a little slower maybe than normal to give the interpreter a chance to uh, translate your, um, your interventions. We have a wonderful panel with us here today uh, of several IPCC authors who will share um, the insights that came forward from this latest round of assessment, um, looking at a broad range of intersections between climate change and the uh, movement of people. Um, and how climate mobility intersects also with various items on the agenda of the UNFCCC. We are organizing this webinar in the context of the ongoing Bonn uh, climate meeting and it at a time when there is growing attention to the importance of human movement in the context of the climate crisis we see the topic rising strongly in the conversations on loss and damage, but we also know that climate mobility has a role to play in people's strategies for climate adaptation. And so we hope to hear today a little bit more about both the prospects, what do we know about the size of the phenomenon, possible future evolutions, um, what do we know about how climate mobility intersects with people's vulnerability to climate change, who is able to move and who is not able to move and how does that relate to their ability to adapt to climatic changes, as well as how um, different issues on the climate agenda, such as the incorporation of local indigenous knowledge, for example, nature-based solutions, for example, intersect with the movement of people and can influence the movement of people in the context of climate change. So we have a full agenda. Um, I see people are introducing themselves in the chat. Please go ahead and do that. Please also feel free to post questions or comments in the chat as we go along. We will probably not have time for a structured questions and answers uh, period at the end. But we do invite you to share your reflections. And as, as speakers um, go along, I think they can also pick up some of those comments and questions and respond to them in the chat. So please, please use the chat actively. And for those who have joined us after I made the announcement, just a reminder again that interpretation is available. If you click on the interpretation button, uh, you can follow this webinar in French. Vous pouvez avoir l'interprétation en français si vous poussez sur le bouton interprétation au bout de votre écran. And now I have the pleasure to start introducing our panelists for today. Um, our first speaker who has kindly agreed to join us is Dr. Kira Winke. Um, who joins us from Berlin, from the Center for Climate and Foreign Policy at the German Council on Foreign Relations, also called DGAP. Um, Kira is also the co-chair of the advisory board to the German federal government on civilian crisis prevention and peace building. Um, she's affiliated as a guest scientist with the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research where she led the East Africa, Peru, India Climate Capacities Project before joining DGAP. Um, before 2018, uh, Kira was a research analyst to the director of PIC, and in that capacity, she worked as an analyst for the German Advisory Council on Global Change to the federal government of Germany. 
Um, she's also been an advisor to GIZ, the German Development Corporation and the Asian Development Bank, and has extensive field research expertise in South Asia, the Pacific and the Sahel. And we invited Kira today to give us a sense of how climate mobility is featuring in the conversations on UNF triple in the UNF triple C process and why it should feature there and how we should be thinking about it in that context. So thank you so much, Kira, for making the time and being with us today. And the floor is yours. Thank you so much for this kind introduction. I'm very happy uh, to be here and um, I will now share my screen. Um, so that you can uh, follow. I hope you can see it just fine now. Great. Um, it's really a pleasure um, to talk uh, today with you about um, the climate mobility nexus in the IPCC and, and beyond that also. Um, I was asked to give a little bit of an overview um, on, on where we stand um, with this topic. And then um, I structured my talk in a way that in the second part, I will also look a little bit uh, beyond what was said um, in the IPCC drawing from my own research in this area. Okay, sorry, just, uh, it's just some technical issues. Um, to start us off, uh, where do we stand um, in terms of uh, climate migration and the COP process? Um, here you can see the um, kind of a timeline of how um, climate migration featured in different uh, IPCC assessment reports starting in 1990, when there was already a strong uh, statement included on uh, climate change and migration saying that the gravest effects of climate change may be those on human migration. Um, and then in the second assessment, um, uh, again, this is resembled, um, if the future climate resemble those projected, this may cause the gravest effects on climate change through sudden migration. And then in the third assessment report, 2001 of the IPCC, one of the statements was human population shows significant tendencies to adapt to interannual variability of climate via migration. So here in this 2001 statement, you can see already a slight shift from this um, perception of migration just as a reaction, as an effect um, of um, physiological climate impacts to more of an adaptation. And then um, in 2004, climate and migration were um, mentioned um, in the documents uh, of the COP14. Moving ahead in the timeline, in the fourth assessment report in 2007, um, there was a strong statement about um, the uncertainty that surrounds the projections of um, climate-related displacement, saying that the estimates of the number of people who may become environmental migrants are at best guesswork. Um, and then 2014, um, it says that displacement risk increases when population that lack the resources for planned migration. So here becomes this uh, distinguishment between um, migration, forced displacement, um, and planned relocation. And then in the sixth assessment report, um, the last assessment report, which we're talking about today, um, again, a strong statement on um, adaptation, migration, when voluntary, safe, and orderly allows reduction of risks to climatic and non-climatic stressors. So you can see here how this perception and the knowledge um, around climate change and migration um, have evolved um, over the whole time period since um, the initial IPCC, IPCC assessment reports and today's um, assessment report. Um, and then uh, on the lower side of this graph, you can see how then also the COP, um, the climate negotiations somehow followed suit. So in COP16, we had the uh, Cancun adaptation um, uh, framework on COP21, um, the Warsaw mechanism for loss and damage uh, was created, which had a task force um, within this uh, Warsaw mechanism. Um, oh, sorry, just to correct, um, the Warsaw mechanism already uh, existed, but this task force was created at COP21. Um, and then um, uh, COP24, the task force on displacement released its phase one reports. 
and uh, its mandate was uh, extended. And then at the last COP, um, COP27, um, the, the historic agreement on the establishment of a new loss and damage fund um, um, was one of the key achievements of that COP and mobility was named um, for the first time in the cover decision of a COP. So you can see here, um, maybe also how science um, has somehow also influenced the decision making in the COP. Although, um, as we all know, the science would require further action, both on the mitigation, adaptation and loss and damage sides of this, of this phenomenon. The latest IPCC report stated again the significance um, of um, every uh, uh, additional warming. Um, it said, with every increment of global warming, changes get larger in regional mean temperature, precipitation, and soil moisture. And uh, we see, see this all around the world. We see it in Europe, we see it in other countries. And um, this translates, of course, also into risks for the populations that live in these areas that are affected by these climatic stressors. So um, this is another graph from the IPCC that um, uh, shows how um, there are uh, different risks and risks is defined by vulnerability, hazard and exposure. Um, and the response can either be an in situ adaptation response or it can be a migration response. And um, then it's also important to note that um, depending on the outcome of this migration, the risks can increase or they can decrease. So um, there is this adaptive element of um, migration, of mobility, um, um, where people are able to somehow um, upkeep their living standards or regain uh, the standard of living after migration. But we are also seeing movements where um, migration sort of becomes um, a poverty trap um, with increasing exposure to um, to different hazards. Another important uh, finding of the IPCC were um, how many people have been displaced already um, due to um, a number of weather related uh, extremes. So you can see here floods, storms, wildfires, droughts, um, especially floods and storms or so the hydrological events um, drive most displacements and the highest number of displacement is occurring in, in Asia, followed um, by the African continent, uh, followed by North America and then uh, um, Central and South America. Um, then the difference again is very big. I cut this part from the graph because it's a very complex graph. Otherwise, um, the difference between the uh, numbers of displacement um, between uh, Central and South America and uh, Europe and Australasia um, are quite significant. So um, uh, there's a very strong difference in the numbers there. So we see that um, much of the displacement um, that is occurring internally is uh, related to uh, natural hazards and some of these hazards are related to climate change. Uh, and this is also confirmed by a more recent number of internal displacements in 2022. Um, where we see new records, um, record numbers of um, disasters displacing, leading to new displacements um, of 32.6 million people in uh, this last year. This was just recently released, this number, so it was not yet included uh, in any estimate of the IPCC. Of course, not all of these um, disasters are climate change uh, related, but we know that um, the number of such disasters and the intensity of these disasters uh, is increasing in that more people are living in exposed areas. Um, and so um, uh, without further adaptation, more and more people um, will be affected by these uh, climatic extremes because also this is stated in the IPCC, regardless of um, mitigation efforts, we will see um, a further increase in global warming to um, at least 1.5 degrees. Um, and then uh, how far we go beyond this warming limit will then define um, the future warming limits uh, towards the end of the century, which could be below two degrees or they could be uh, much beyond that um, up to four degrees or more. And so um, very important to uh, now moving a little bit away from um, the IPCC uh, findings and more a little bit into my own research. 
Um, what we know is that um, climate migration um, can be adaptive, um, but it can be also maladaptive. And we distinguished in this paper um, that we published uh, three years ago between um, reactive and proactive migration. So reactive migration in response um, to uh, already occurred uh, climate hazards or as a proactive um, sort of adaptive measure um, in anticipation of uh, extreme events or um, of a slow degradation that will make life more difficult. And I think it's very important to distinguish um, between um, adaptive, maladaptive migration and also survival migration, um, because um, both the aims of these migrations um, are different. Um, so much of the reactive migration is sort of a survival mecha mechanism. People are just trying to basically save their lives. And this is often possible only through migration if there's a very extreme event happening. Um, and um, then there's also this pursuit of um, upkeeping the standard of living or even improving the standard of living through migration. Um, also in response um, to climate change uh, effects. So, for example, if a farmer knows that um, the drought conditions uh, will get worse um, over the next 10 years, um, uh, he or she may try to diversify um, crops, but it may also be um, considered to do seasonal migration, to engage in seasonal migration in order to adapt to these changes in the future. And so um, this can be used as a strategy to stabilize incomes, um, um, for example, in the off season, uh, when there's uh, not so much to do in the fields, for example. Um, yeah, I just wanted to highlight, um, because the focus has been very strong uh, in the last IPCC and also in other documents on um, uh, the adaptive responses of migration and while i agree that um, migration is an important tool for adaptation i see what is now occurring often um, that uh, migration is leading people into further impoverishment so people are able to um, uh, to save their lives um, so uh, after they are perhaps displaced for example they are able to save their lives through migration but um, they're not able to maintain their standard of living. So um, just to give you some examples from field research um, we did in Bangladesh, um, when we interviewed people who were displaced in the context of tropical um, cyclones, um, for example, one person said, we, after they were displaced into a city, we can only survive here. We were better in the village when we had our own land. Now we are like beggars or uh, we live by hands to mouth, another person that was displaced uh, in the context of uh, tropical cyclones. And several years, even after this, um, um, this movement, uh, these people were not able to um, keep their standard of living through, through migration. And then also looking at uh, more non-economic loss and damages, um, for example, here some, some insights from the Marshall Islands. Um, one person uh, told us, um, I don't care if I go under the sea, but I'll remain here. If I move to the US, who would I be? They don't have coconut trees, they don't have pandanus trees, they don't have our fish. Um, they have theirs, but they don't taste like ours. I would, I will have no identity. So this question of, of identity and then also um, the, uh, the longing for home, which also featured in many interviews that we did. Um, so, for example, here for myself, I'm moving here to work, but I always um, hope to go back to my island. This was the person who moved from one of the outer islands um, to um, the capital, Majuro of the Marshall Islands, but still had this hope of returning um, home. And um, maybe just uh, one more uh, case study of the island of uh, Barbuda in the, in the Caribbean, which was um, so almost completely destroyed the infrastructure by um, tropical cyclone Irma, um, and where people uh, eventually returned, but that this uh, return was also posing like significant challenges. So here, for example, this person um, told us, the Barbudan people have been affected psychologically since the passage of Hurricane Irma and even more traumatized since we were made to evacuate from our homes, from our lands. 
Some people have never traveled out of Barbuda before. Now that we have returned to Barbuda, people are finding it difficult to reestablish themselves. Um, so you can see that even this, um, um, this return migration is causing significant um, uh, uh, challenges for the people who are affected. Um, here I wanted to share some entry points for policies um, to manage human mobility in the context of climate change. So there are the climatic drivers of human mobility in the context of climate change. Um, so here risk reduction is, uh, is important, so mitigation, um, but also um, um, on the other side, uh, the reduction of vulnerability of the society and then um, the improvement of the management of human mobility in the context of climate change. So different, um, different policies for different types of mobility, migration, displacement, plant uh, relocation. Um, let me skip through um, this. Um, so just to, to wrap up, I think there's a lot of new momentum for the protection of the rights of uh, climate migrants, people who are uh, um, who are affected by this crisis in a way that um, makes them move or makes them inclined to move. Um, so there is the Strategic Framework for Climate Action by UNHCR. Um, there's the report on the um, impact of climate change on migration by the White House. And there was also the, the Climate Mobility Pavilion, um, which the Global Center for Climate Mobility kindly hosted um, at uh, the last COP. And so I think there is um, some more interest in this topic and therefore also perhaps uh, um, some political momentum building to, to move this forward. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kira, for giving this really useful <clears throat> overview and background, but also really conceptually laying out the different qualities, if you will, that um, movement can take, um, whether it is reactive or proactive. Um, I think your point around the increased vulnerability that often results from movement is well taken. At the same time, we are sadly probably looking at a reality where <laughs> increased poverty and vulnerability will be a reality also for people who stay. Um, and I think even being uprooted will probably be an experience for people who do not physically relocate um, just because of the changes they are seeing in their environment. And so. I, um, I think we're also kind of in a situation where we are looking at mobility in a context where even staying is probably um, associated with confronting significant changes. And, um, and I, we're not yet, I think, in a position really to look at what does it mean comparatively staying versus moving. Um, in terms of outcomes for people. So there is work to be done there, but this was a really very useful overview and conceptual introduction. So thank you so much for this. Um, I'd like to move on to our next speaker, Dr. Nick Simpson, my colleague at the Global Center for Climate Mobility. Nick heads up the knowledge and practice work in Africa for the Global Center. He is also an IPCC author, um, and his research has focused on human responses to climate change and climate resilient development pathways for Africa. Nick has published over 50 peer reviewed articles since 2018, including the first continental scale studies of climate change literacy rates across Africa and on climate risk to Africa's coastal heritage. So I'm very pleased to give the floor to Nick, who will talk to current realities and future projections of climate mobility. Thank you, Sarah. Um, uh, and good afternoon, good morning, everyone. Human-caused climate change is already affecting many weather and climate extremes in every region across the globe. Evidence of observed changes in extremes such as heat waves, heavy precipitation, droughts, and tropical cyclones, and in particular, their attribution to human influence has strengthened since the last IPCC round. We know a lot more about all of those climate variables now. Adverse impacts have been observed for multiple sectors across every region of the world, 
from human caused climate change. And this is projected to continue to intensify. The relationship between climate change and migration is complex, but we are now much more certain that climate is playing a key role in altering patterns of migration. Climate change is projected to increase migration, especially internal and rural to urban migration. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change emphasizes that contrary to some prevailing discourses, most climate mobility observed currently is within countries or between neighboring countries rather than to distant high income countries. We therefore need to concentrate efforts on internal migration and displacement that is motivated by climate impacts. Current emission pathways leads to a scenario for the period between 2050 and 2100 in which hundreds of millions of people will be at risk of displacement due to rising sea levels, floods, tropical cyclones, droughts, extreme heat, wildfires, and other hazards, with land degradation exacerbating these risks in many regions. Involuntary immobility could become severe for highly vulnerable populations with limited resources, even with moderate levels of warming. And extreme weather events are identified as leading causes of forced displacement. For example, in Africa, deteriorating economic conditions caused by climate hazards can encourage out migration. However, these same conditions, these same economic losses, undermine household resources needed to migrate. Some findings suggest in low income countries, high temperatures trap people at home and lower migration rates abroad. But in middle income countries, these same high temperatures encourage immigration. Sorry, Nick, just one, I don't want to mean to interrupt you, but uh, several people have pointed out that the slides aren't moving. Is that by design? They're coming now. The oh, slides. okay, sorry, okay, sorry. Thanks, Sarah. With every additional one degree Celsius of warming, the global risks of involuntary displacement due to flood events are projected to rise by approximately 50%. At progressive levels of warming, involuntary migration from regions with high exposure and low adaptive capacity will occur. And that migration can increase future exposure to climate hazards for those lacking resources to realize positive outcomes from moving. SPM figure one from the synthesis report shows observed impacts on ecosystems and human systems attributed to climate change at global and regional scales. It is essentially a synthesis of the lost and the damaged from climate impacts and highlights climate impacts on multiple factors affecting human mobility with explicit reference to displacement. Climate and weather extremes are increasingly driving displacement in all regions of the world with small island states disproportionately affected. Displacement and involuntary migration from extreme weather and climate change events have generated and perpetuated vulnerability across the world. Numerous studies find significant links between temperature or precipitation anomalies or extreme weather events such as storms or floods and inter inter international migration. Non-economic losses are often associated with displacements and migration in terms of climate change and human vulnerability. Studies show that the impacts of extreme flooding, droughts and or hurricanes and cyclones that can lead to a sense of 
loss of identity, heritage, and place, and emotional distress. But they are currently poorly assessed dimensions of the impacts of climate change. But there is robust evidence and medium agreement that increased climate variability and extreme events are already driving migration in Asia, for example. There has been no association established yet between international migration and conflict. Increases in extreme heat and impacts on crops, for example, will affect climate mobility with consequences for both mobility and immobility. This figure from the synthesis report, longer report, shows climate hazards can initiate risk cascades that affect multiple sectors and propagate across regions following complex natural and social connections. This example of a compound heat wave and drought event striking an agricultural region shows how multiple risks are interconnected and lead to cascading impacts, even in distant regions, with vulnerable groups such as smallholder farmers, children, and pregnant women particularly impact. It highlights the importance of mobility as an adaptation option. Under these compound climate events, staying in place, whether voluntary or involuntary, can mean increased exposure and vulnerability, particularly for these vulnerable groups. Negative impacts on food yields and food quality losses have cascading impacts on food security, malnutrition, quality of life. But importantly, it can also erode the household asset base and income, increasing the potential for movement under stressed conditions. Case studies from over 20 countries highlight migration under these conditions is mostly undertaken by poorer households and can be associated with broader climate impacts, such as weakened local subsistence production capacity, disrupted family structures, reduced labor available for agricultural work, increased burden responsibilities on women, fostered loss of solidarity within communities, lower education outcomes for children, lower overall life earning capacity, increased divorce rates, exacerbated conflicts among different groups, expanded slum settlements around riparian and coastal areas, including floodplains and swamplands. With further warming, climate risks will become increasingly complex and more difficult to manage as multiple climatic and non-climatic risks interact, resulting in compounding overall risks, making mobility extremely challenging to achieve positive outcomes. But more inclusive socioeconomic pathways with lower population growth are projected to reduce these risks. So this has been a brief overview of the current realities and future projections of climate, of, oh, sorry, of migration and displacement in the IPCC assessment. Um, thank you. Thank you, Nick. Um, that was a lot in a short time span. Um, so it's, uh, it's a shame we don't have time for question and answers actually, but I, I, again, like I encourage people to put questions also in the chat because I feel like um, there was a lot there and it was quite dense, but what we can take from your um, report and from Kira's presentation also is a, of course, the increasing levels of displacement that we already see, so climate, um, movement, climate mobility, not just a future projected reality, but actually a current reality that is already happening um, and that it comes with significant losses, both economic and non-economic. Um, so that also is a clear finding. Um, and again, that the adaptation potential is very much dependent 
on the overall context of the levels of vulnerability in the society overall, um, but then also, of course, specific to the household characteristics, the characteristics of the people who move their, their assets. Um, so we'll hear more about this, um, but without further ado, we'll go to our next speaker, um, which is Professor Mark Tabbert, um, who is speaking on mobility as adaptation, immobility, and maladaptation. So this is, a, again, like a very big package. And Mark, thank you for taking us through it. Um, Mark is um, the co-leader for the Tyndall Center's research activities on understanding how to address the twin goals of poverty alleviation and achieving meaningful action on climate change. Um, Professor Mark has worked on a number of climate mobility related research projects, including coordinating a major program of research in the pastoralist drylands of East Africa through the Adaptation at Scale in Semi-Arid Regions Research Project. Mark, thank you so much for joining us and the floor is yours. Thanks very much, uh, Sarah, much appreciated. So <laughs> I'm going to frame my contribution around a diagram which is adapted from chapter seven and the cross chapter box on migration. And it presents a simplified framework of how we understand um, how migration and displacement may emerge from interactions of climatic and non-climatic factors based on the characteristic risk framework which the IPCC has developed. Now, on the left side of the diagram, let's see, yeah, kind of this bit here, it's not a great square, but anyway, there we go. Uh, we see the risk framework and that encompasses hazard, vulnerability and exposure. Now, hazard includes acute hazards such as storms, floods and wildfires, as well as more chronic hazards um, like drought, higher temperature, sea level rise. Vulnerability, um, so propensity to be adversely affected, and again is influenced by a range of differing and intersectional factors such as age, gender, or socioeconomic status, for, ex for example. And then exposure is simply the presence of people or places in settings that could be adversely affected directly um, through the loss of land by erosion, for instance, or indirectly through maybe income losses as a result of changes in yield. Now, all of these propeller blades interact and are affected by climatic and non-climatic factors, necessitating a range of responses at various scales. And I actually want to kind of focus the majority of my talk on the, the right hand side. Um, and we can see that there are a range of different mobility responses that may arise as a result of the risk dynamic. Um, but before I do that, just to kind of go back a step and say that we've got this in situ uh, adaptation and adaptation here is understood as a process of adjustment to actual or expected climate and its effects in order to try and moderate harm or exploit opportunities. And in many instances, in situ adaptation is feasible, it's, desirely, it's desirable and currently achievable, and that works to uh, lower risk. So we can see the top dotted arrow um, resulting in a smaller risk circle. Um, However, there are times when wholly in situ adaptation is undesired or it's not practical, which sees levels of risk increase and people choose to or are forced to employ mobility. Um, and that's really reflected in the, the bottom arrow going down here. So limits to in situ adaptation have been reached, which increases the risks that people are exposed to. Um, and I want to highlight here that when people use mobility, we should not be thinking of it purely in terms of a failure to adapt or an adaptation of last resort, although that can be the case. Frequently, migration is understood um, and undertaken as a positive choice and results in very successful outcomes. And this is despite 
um, I guess, much policy and discourse around migration, which still implicitly, I guess, draws on a sedentary bias, whereby success equals staying put and failure equals moving. And this, you know, there's a huge uh, wealth of evidence very aptly synthesized by the IPCC, which shows this is incorrect. And so um, migration is a universal strategy um, evident in every region of the world, and we need to put in place measures to enable and facilitate safe, orderly and regular migration, rather than, I guess, falling back on policies that seek to keep people in their place with all of the attendant implications that has. So mobility can be an effective adaptation strategy, but this is highly context specific and the evidence on migration and its impacts on adaptive capacity and risk reduction are very mixed as the IPCC have reviewed. Um, moreover, the idea of migration as adaptation has also been contested, and this alludes to a point that Nick raised previously, it won't necessarily overcome all of the structural problems um, that people experience or point to in situ um, adaptation options. So migration does not necessarily mean that people move out of risk. Um, rather, it, you know, it can mean that people effectively carry risk with them, and it's just the risk portfolio changes but the overall amount of risk that people are experiencing doesn't necessarily change. And in fact, globally, maladaptation has been reported most frequently in the context of agriculture and uh, migration in the global south. And we also see instances of compounding crises leading to maladaptive outcomes. And that is the case for migrants in South and Southeast Asia that in the last two to three years have been severely affected by climatic hazards, labour precarity and the ongoing COVID pandemic. Um, and then I guess one final point in relation to this is that migration as adaptation is not available to all. So there are constraints on mobility for certain groups. Um, for instance, mobility in Africa was assessed to have low feasibility owing to economic, institutional and technical constraints. So. What does this all mean? Well, mobility can be an effective adaptation strategy to lower risk, and we see um, we see evidence of that, but this isn't available to all, and sometimes mobility can lead to maladaptive outcomes. Um, and to bring this all together, uh, then I've got four take home messages uh, sort of drawn from AR6 in relation to mobility. These messages are mostly encapsulated within Chapter 7 of Working Group 2 on health, well-being and the changing structure of communities, although migration is kind of peppered through regional assessments that are contained in chapters from 5 through to 15. So, firstly, mobility is a universal strategy that people undertake to improve well-being and livelihoods in response to change and uncertainty so we see mobility being used in every part of the world to manage a dynamic risk portfolio to exploit livelihood opportunities and to boost their well-being second um, migration is already occurring globally in part response to climate change and evidence suggests as uh, People have said previously that this will become larger in the future, although that does depend strongly on the pathways that we choose as a society and then the amount of climate change that we see, as well as the other socioeconomic political dynamics that are occurring globally and will continue to occur in the future. Um, but I think just uh, a few caveats underlying this statement. Um, Firstly, and emphasizing Nick's point that most migration, most mobility is internal within countries. And if it's international, then it's likely to be intra-regional. Although, although the, the, I guess the hard numbers on internal migration are, are quite hard to come by, it's thought to be around a ratio of three to one. So approximately uh, 750 million internal migrants to 250 million uh international migrants so significantly more internal migrants most migration originates within rural areas with destinations being other rural areas or urban settings and then lastly i guess to, to highlight 
the, the little bit in parentheses, so occurring globally in part response to climate change. And that is just to emphasize that almost all migration is multi-causal. So climate change, yes, contributes to people's migratory decisions, contributes to uh, forcing people to, to move in some instances, but it is very rarely the sole reason why that happens. So we need to recognize that people are making very complex decisions about migration, and that is being driven by a range of factors of which climate change is one. Um, third, having made a number of simple generalizations, I'm now going to contradict myself and say that simple generalizations about mobility are difficult to provide. And this is really in relation to the diversity of hazards and I guess the range of factors that influence mobility. Um, we see a large diversity in outcomes and multi-directionality in terms of changes in mobility behavior. And by that, I mean that you could have a, a hazard event that's notionally the same. So we could say um, uh, a period of significant rainfall, which leads to a flood. And depending where that hazard event occurs, you will get very different mobility outcomes based on the socioeconomic conditions, based on, I guess, previous history of migration and a range of different factors. So it's very difficult to infer general lessons um, about how people are going to behave within a given set of circumstances. Um, and I think Nick provided a very good example earlier um, about how temperatures in low income countries can uh, trap people at home, whereas in middle income countries, uh, similar higher temperatures can encourage more international migration. So that's a very good example of how the same, the same driver can result in two different outcomes. Um, and then my final, I guess my final take home message um, is that the IPC conclude that if people do move, then the outcomes of that mobility, and by which I mean whether or not it's considered a, sec a success, are highly variable. Um, and again, this variability is due to a number of reasons, but I'm going to group them into two main areas for simplicity. Um, and that is the degree to which mobility is considered voluntary. Um, are derived from the agency that people possess. And broadly, the more agency that people have and are able to exert over their mobility decisions, the greater the likelihood that that mobility will result in success. Um, the converse is always true, that the less agency that people have, so the more that mobility is considered forced or immobility for that reason is considered forced, then the less likely it is that those mobility or immobility outcomes will be um, successful. And I think you can see that in the burgeoning amount of literature around trapped populations, people that are unable to leave their home environments despite experiencing worsening conditions. And then the second, um, the second reason why we see a very strong variation in mobility outcomes relates to people's pre-existing capabilities. Um, and again, this, this kind of comes back to something that I touched on earlier. So whilst people are able to move, um, they don't move and significantly alter the structures, um, socioeconomic, sociopolitical structures, which influence um, how they experience the world. So uh, if people are wealthier, if people have higher levels of education, greater capacities, we could say, um, and there's more likelihood that their mobility will be successful. Conversely, those with more limited capacities will tend to experience less favorable migrations. So whilst mobility is a way to obviate risk, it doesn't mean that in moving, people leave all of the risk behind. The risk often ports with them to new locations. And I think you can see that in a, a variety of different settings and case studies that have been highlighted by the IPCC in uh in their messages on climate migration thanks very much thank you very much mark um thank you for highlighting really this point of um you know moving um will change your risk portfolio as you put it but not necessarily always reduce the level of risk and i think that 
that's not a comfortable frame of mind, but probably an appropriate frame of mind generally for approaching, um, you know, what is likely a very uh, hazardous climate future. So um, less and less, it's kind of a, a question between like a really good choice and a bad choice, but more like what are the trade-offs um, and, and, and how do you balance risks in one place versus risks in another place? I think one thing that we are uh, pushing as Global Center for Climate Mobility is A, people having awareness uh, of the risks they're facing so they can better understand these trade-offs and can better understand what are the risks in places that they might want to leave or where they might want to go. Um, and that also applies obviously for government institutions. So access to that kind of information and data is critical. And this ties in with a question that came in the chat around, well, how do we predict these kinds of movements? As you highlighted, Mark, it's very difficult. There's a lot of factors at play. Climate impacts are not the only drivers of movement. So projecting movements and future numbers of people moving have been quite contested. We have done it. We continue to do it as the global center, very much with the intention of changing um, mindsets towards the more anticipatory approach where the sedentary bias around like you know normal is staying gets called into question so it's i think less a question of do we get the exact number of projected people moving right and more a question of can we shift our approach to one that is forward looking anticipatory and that wraps its mind around the fact that movement may just become a more normal part of life in the future with that, I'm very pleased to go to our next speaker, um, Dr. Portia Adada Williams, um, who joins us from Ghana. And uh, Dr. Portia is also an IPCC author. She led the first peer reviewed and award winning adaptation feasibility assessment for Africa. And she'll speak to the IPCC's assessment of the feasibility of human mobility as a form of adaptation across different regions and population groups. Dr. Adade Williams is a research scientist with the Science and Technology Policy Research Institute in Ghana. And this is an institution of the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research. Um, Portia was a contributing author to the IPCC Africa chapter and also to the 2022-2032 African Union Climate Change and Resilient Development Strategy and Action Plans. Her research interests focus on climate vulnerability, impact, and adaptation in food and agricultural systems. And without further ado, Portia, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Sarah, and good day, everyone. So I'll zoom in straight into what the IPCC assessment report says about adaptation feasibility of human mobility across different regions and population groups in Africa. To start um, within IPCC context, feasibility is defined as the degree to which implementation of adaptation response are considered possible or probably desirable. This is important because in the feasibility and effectiveness of adaptation options, IPCC considers risk, it considers merits and the merits of adaptation options. It evaluates how successful a response is at reducing risk and also notes barriers that may hinder implementation of adaptation responses. So what is the IPCC report saying about the state of feasibility and adaptation effectiveness of climate mobility in the SIS assessment reports. It presents a quite a compelling assessment of the feasibility and effectiveness of climate mobility for Africa. It's based on multidimensional systematic assessment of climate mobility in the scientific literature, looking way back from 2013 to 2021. Encouragingly, Human mobility is assessed by the report as a potentially effective adaptation strategy in Africa. And this was seen across sectors like food systems, like water, livelihoods, and in climate-induced conflict areas under current global warming levels. So while human 
mobility is a potentially effective adaptation strategy. The report also cautions with high confidence that it can also be maladaptive if vulnerability is increased. And I think Mark alluded to this earlier. So according to the reports, there was limited evidence to assess the continued effectiveness of mobility at higher global warming levels, showing high risk as continued warming may increase adaptation limits above 1.5 or 2 degrees Celsius. And there was also limited evidence available in the literature about environmental impacts of migration. So if you can see from the figure here, coming from Working Group 2, Chapter 9, that's the Africa Chapter Reports, the effectiveness dimension of feasibility for human mobility is high. And how is this the case? The report notes that migration can lead to increased income and studies, for instance, positively related risk reduction and human food security status that provided an opportunity to earn income to migration. It can, however, be seen from the figure here again that migration in Africa as an adaptation option has low feasibility, despite its high potential to reduce risk. So why? The report provides some thrust to the interests of scientific communities in attributing low migration feasibility to technical, institutional, and economic constraints. Technical coming from factors such as poorly resourced regional and national climate information service centers to make accurate weather forecasts that can inform migrants to adequately plan ahead of a climatic event or a disaster. Also, IPCC makes it clear that a key problem to implementation is governance and institutional arrangements with challenges such as low commitment to climate policy objectives, inadequate financing and banking structures or infrastructure in most areas limits potential benefits from remittances that comes from migrants posing economic challenges as well. Another key finding from the report is that out outcomes from climate mobility are highly context specific. So feasibility is context specific such that there is currently limited evidence and low agreement in the literature as to whether in what context human migration of various types is an effective strategy to specific localized climate impacts. With this, local contextual factors such as values, such as norms, such as development patterns and resource limitations are presented in the report to play a key role in feasibility. In considering differences in feasibility of human mobility between countries globally, the report knows, it knows that the largest absolute number of people displaced by extreme weather each year Okay, it's mainly in Asia, and then Africa also follows up. But small island states in the Caribbean and South Pacific areas are also disproportionately affected. According to the reports, climatic conditions are important drivers of migration and are strongly influenced again by economic, social, political, and demographic processes. So examples are given in low-income countries where studies report that high temperatures, like Max said, trap people at home with lower migration rates abroad. But in the middle-income countries, these same temperatures would encourage emigration. Also, most common climatic drivers for migration and displacement across Central and South America are reported to be droughts, tropical storms, and hurricanes. In Africa, across regions, adverse climate conditions for agri and pastoral livelihoods was mostly reported. For instance, in dry land areas, including Northern Ghana and Burkina Faso, migration as a result of unfavorable environmental conditions closely linked to climate change has often provided opportunities for farmers to earn income. In contrast to this, studies demonstrate that across Peru, for example, non-climatic reasons are migrants' motivation in many areas, and water-related climatic drivers are now only becoming 
increasingly relevant in Peru. And then in Latin America also, it's rather compounding effects of climate impacts such as disasters and armed conflicts that has contributed to forced migration to the point that in 2018 alone, 1.7 million people migrated due to extreme events. So what's about feasibility across intersectional and compounding vulnerability among social groups? The report makes it very clear that more evidence is needed on intersectional factors that make mobility an option for some, but not for others. So it already opens a window of opportunity for researchers. Research efforts, particularly those providing focus on gender and migration, provide links between different patterns and gender. This link does not provide adequate grounded evidence on gender perspective and analysis. And in changing gender norms and gender equality, empowerment and social transformation outcomes are quite deficient in the report. So the intersectional dimensions of these differences remain poorly understood, but evidence suggests that younger, educated and married men are more likely to be mobile than others. The extent to which these intersection factors influence migration outcomes, are, they remain poorly understood in the reports. Next slide, please. So IPCC AR6 actually alludes to the fact that up to 3 million new weather-related displacements occurred in Sub-Saharan Africa in 2018 and 2019. This is almost like 14% of the global total and one of the highest historical figures for Africa. With further global warming to 1.5, we are even looking up to like um, 40 million plus people migrating internally in Sub-Saharan Africa. So what is the IPCC report suggesting as way forward to enhancing feasibility and effectiveness of climate mobility? Actually, three points come up strongly, relevance for policy and then practice. Firstly, the assessment recognizes mobility outcomes are dependent on social and political processes. For people displaced by climate change impacts, policy interventions have a determining influence on migration outcomes. The report therefore calls for supportive policies and programs that are more inclusive, that are locally led, equitable, integrated, and have transboundary cooperation among others, specifically looking at policies that can build adaptive capacity and provide enabling communities support to both outgoing and incoming residents policies that can, can reduce bureaucratic hurdles and barriers to mobility and policies that support livelihoods, communities, and some sense of identity. Secondly, the, policy, the, the report actually recognizes losses and damage and strongly calls for targeted investments and capacity building, providing that includes climate literacy for vulnerable populations to expand opportunities for mobility. Then lastly, the report also highlights the need to identify research priorities. Um, as I earlier mentioned, examples include effectiveness of human mobility under future change and their feasibility under future conditions. This is an area that the report calls for further research into. It also, there is more evidence that, again, I said earlier, is needed on intersectional factors that influence adaptation outcomes with priorities addressing equity and social justice. This is also important because dimensions of mobility, especially those facing the greatest climate mobility challenges, such as women, children, the elderly, the indigenous groups, and those with disabilities, low income and low education and more, broadly, the refugees and stateless persons, the internally displaced people, there is that important need that intersectional dimensions are also looked at that influences outcomes of climate mobility. So I think these are some of the reflections on what ER6 says about adaptation, feasibility, 
that um, I'll reflect on now for now. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Adade. Um, that <clears throat> was a really important, I think, highlight on the different abilities that people have to move. And you mentioned some of the groups um, that might have uh, more constraints on their ability to move, um, including women, the elderly, um, marginalized groups that um, are not as easily um, able to access migration, whether it's internal or across borders. At the same time, we see this obviously also across countries, which countries will um, have it easier to uh, access international migration opportunities. Um, we know that those are not evenly distributed and um, the world regions that are more affected by climate uh, risk and vulnerability often also face greater barriers to access to international mobility. So, so, the, so I think this presentation was really um, important for highlighting really um, the, the difference uh, abilities uh, or as, as the IPCC puts it, feasibility of being able to move. Um, and that that in itself is an important um, question of uh, adaptation. So um, less maybe the question of are people moving, but as um, Mark Tabith put it, the agency that they have in, um, in accessing that opportunity in, in having that option um, at all. The next speaker is Mr. Luxon Svobo, I hope I didn't butcher your name, um, who is joining us um, from Cape Town. He is a postdoctoral post fellow at the African Climate and Development Initiative at the University of Cape Town. Um, and his doctoral thesis investigates the role of indigenous knowledge and local knowledge in adaptation to climate change for smallholder farmers. His work demonstrates how indigenous knowledge and local knowledge can reduce the vulnerability of smallholder farmers to climate impacts and also support the implementation of adaptation actions. And he will speak to us very much about this topic. So how um, do indigenous and local knowledges play a role in supporting adaptation to climate change and supporting climate mobility. Uh, looks on, the floor is yours. And I understand that you may be off camera due to connection issues, but please go ahead. Thank you so much, Sarah. That was a very generous introduction. Yeah, um, so maybe I need to give a brief background on what do we mean by indigenous knowledge and local knowledge in the context of IPCC. So to start with, um, indigenous knowledge, uh, this basically refers to the understandings, the skills, and the philosophies that are developed by societies uh, due to their long uh, historical interaction with uh, their natural surroundings. Whereas um, local knowledge um, refers to the understandings and skills developed by individuals and populations, uh, and these are quite uh, area specific. So from the uh, topic itself, you can see that um, climate mobility or displacement due to climate hazards can uh, obviously interfere with indigenous knowledge and, and local knowledge and their capacity uh, for people that rely on this knowledge to adapt to climate change. So uh, to give a background on uh, indigenous knowledge and uh, local knowledge coverage in the IPCC. So uh, in AR5, uh, which was published around 2014, the coverage of indigenous knowledge and local knowledge was uh, quite good. But in this round, um, the sixth assessment, uh, indigenous knowledge and local knowledge uh, it has been quite uh, extensively covered uh, across the regions, and it's one of the IPCC uh, uh, reports with uh, the most uh, indigenous and local knowledge um, material. So um, 
I'll start uh, giving on uh, some high level um, out, uh, knowledge outputs from the IPCC IRS 6 uh, across the globe on indigenous knowledge and local knowledge. Uh, and um, uh, three main uh, points or key messages coming from the IPCC IRS 6 is that um, indigenous and local knowledge helps to prevent maladaptation. It increases the prospects of climate resilient development. At the same time, it also increases the effectiveness of uh, adaptation options. And in a moment, I'm going to show how indigenous knowledge is able to do all this. Uh, and um, so in terms of maladaptation, we all know that um, maladaptation can be as a result of people not included in the implementation or in the planning of adaptation responses. And this can uh, only be prevented if uh, things like cultural values and uh, social acceptabilities of adaptation responses are taken into consideration that is working with indigenous peoples and local communities and uh, vulnerable groups such as smallholder farmers, women, children. And also if you integrate uh, indigenous and local knowledge in adaptation options, this increases their effectiveness. And the evidence was quite robust from the IPCC, mostly from uh, water, food, uh, related adaptation, where uh, case studies of um, indigenous people and local communities participating, these adaptation responses have show high levels of uh, indigenous, so they've show high levels of uh, effectiveness. And um, this was quite spread across uh, most of the regions that rely on indigenous and local knowledge, that is South and Central America, uh, Asia, as well as uh, in Africa. And then moving on to, how climate mobility and can be a driver or it can be also a constraint to indigenous and local knowledge. And from the definition itself, it says um, indigenous knowledge is, uh, these are skills that people develop after a long time of interacting with the environment and the surroundings. So basically this is attached to places. And in case of displacements, this might affect uh, the applicability of some of the indigenous and local practices, especially where displacements are cutting across uh, regions, they are cutting across borders. But uh, if the, these displacements are happening at much local level, at a community level or at a provincial level, the applicability of some of the indigenous knowledge might be quite high. So in terms of um, moving on to the, as the migration uh, expands to other regions, as such you see in, in the Horn of Africa, where most of the people, the vulnerable groups, more the farmers were uh, displaced from countries like uh, Ethiopia, Eritrea to the neighboring countries. And these are the people that rely mostly on indigenous and local knowledge and their displacement can be a barrier to the effective adaptation. adaptation. But however, uh, climate mobility as well uh, can also be a, a positive driver to some of the indigenous and local practices. And um, in this uh, slide, I'm going to show you some of the quite uh, effective adaptation responses that are supplied by indigenous and local knowledge that were recorded in area six and where are they recorded? And these are just examples. The literature is very enormous and there are quite a number of um, uh, case studies where indigenous knowledge and local knowledge have been applied and is very effective. But what I'm giving you here is just an examples of some of the most effective uh, adaptation responses that were supported by indigenous and local knowledge. So, the most common um, adaptation option that was recorded in era six was uh, climate forecasting. And this evidence spreads across regions. In Africa, there's high 
uh, numbers of farmers, smallholder farmers, communities that are forecasting um, climate and make necessary arrangements, make necessary preparatory actions to adapt. And also in Asia and uh, South and Central America, a lot of uh, indigenous peoples, especially in South, South, South and Central America, where over 20 million indigenous peoples and local communities live, they have been implementing uh, most of these uh, indigenous and local understandings to focus weather and make an necessary arrangements in terms of how to prepare, when to plant and to what to plant. And these are helping them in adapting to climate uh, impacts. And also when we look at uh, uh, practice such as uh, head splitting for pastoral farmers, you can see that there is an involvement of migration, especially in Africa's uh, East Africa. We are talking about Ethiopia and Kenya, where the Maasai uh, pastoral farmers uh, migrate from one region to another within the country. And uh, they are kind of uh, advised by indigenous and local knowledge of interpreting, interpreting the environment to say, okay, if uh, the whether or if the surrounding is behaving in this way, is that is the time to move us uh, our head to the next region where there are, where there is enough pastures, and also the use of indigenous knowledge to harvest water. This could be for irrigation. This could be for domestic use, and uh, this was quite um, effective in regions such as Asia and uh, South America where, uh, where water security issues are always a challenge. And most of the indigenous communities, indigenous people are applying this knowledge to uh, at least harvest uh, some of the rainwater and then use it in, uh, during the period of scarcity. And also not just, uh, so it, it, this IK and OK is not only linked to behavioral changes or behavioral adaptation responses, but also there is some hard infrastructure that are advised by indigenous and local knowledge, uh, which are also like physical earth walls to adapt to floods and also some infrastructure uh, such as ice tubers and snow barrier baths that are being built by some mountain region communities to adapt to snow melting and also the resultant floods from the snow melt. And um, if you look at South America and uh, North America, issues of uh, veiled fires caused by extreme heat are always a challenge. And indigenous communities, indigenous lands are uh, always way ahead of um, managing these uh, veiled fires, especially where uh, practices such as um, forward burning is practiced. So forward burning is just a practice where when you anticipate a, a veiled fire, farmers uh, or indigenous communities, they kind of um, burn uh, the forest earlier, but not burn all of it, but burn areas where they can protect a huge uh, remaining part of the forest. And also, you can also see that uh, heritage uh, 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 application of indigenous and local knowledge in the heritage adaptation is quite uh, also coming up. And uh, this was missing in most of the uh, previous IPCC assessments. But in this uh, round, there was an attempt to also show, OK, how can I, how can I can, OK, support uh, heritage adaptation? And a good example is from the sacred Kaya forest, where communities, they don't uh, cut down the trees for a specific area because uh, they save as specific cultural uh, purpose. And that alone is a very positive uh, adaptation response. And uh, you can also lastly look at uh, how the use of native uh, seed uh, for adapting to droughts, where drought uh, seeds are being used by smallholder farmers, by indigenous uh, communities to adapt to the different uh, climate uh, impacts. But uh, going forward, uh, I think uh, it is important for 
indigenous and local knowledge to be considered in um, ad national adaptation planning processes. And this should be reflected in NDCs and uh, NAPs, all these uh, formal and institutional tools that are used by, um, by governments to adapt. So it is important that the consideration of indigenous and local knowledge uh, also take um, a higher course and see, to make sure that um, uh, the, that important uh, aspect is not left out because in the past, uh, if you look at many uh, institutional and uh, formal adaptation uh, planning, you see that there is always a lack of uh, consideration of indigenous and local knowledge. So going forward, it is important that uh, these are also taken into consideration 100% to make sure that um, vulnerability is addressed from all aspects and for all. And um, so I think uh, for now, I would end here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Luxon. Um, and really interesting the, your observation around, you know, the continued applicability of local and indigenous knowledge in the context of human mobility. <clears throat> Although I recall uh, your colleague Nick Simpson sending me an article this morning around the change of climate zones in the world. And so maybe people move with their climate zone um, whereas the environment where they usually have resided is, is getting out of step with, with their knowledge. So <laughs> there, I think there are some also open questions there, but this was really interesting. Thank you also for giving these really concrete examples. Um, we are running out of time, so I'm going straight to the last speaker, um, Dr. Petra Holden. Thank you for joining us. Um, Petra is an inter- and transdisciplinary conservation scientist at the African Climate and Development Initiative at the University of Cape Town also. Her current research focuses on exploring equitable and sustainable approaches to nature-based solutions, such as ecosystem restoration or protection approaches. To address societal challenges with a focus on climate change adaptation and ecosystems and landscapes, that are important for water supply in Southern Africa. And Dr. Petra will speak to us about building resilience in the context of climate mobility through nature-based solutions. Petra, the floor is yours. Thank you, Sarah. Um, thank you for that introduction. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, not easy to be the last talk after such uh, rich interventions from the previous speakers. But what I'm going to do is uh, take us on a quick journey, hopefully quick, um, of what we do know about nature-based solutions from the recent IPCC assessment. Um, while trying to make links to what this might mean for adaptation policy and practice in the context of mobility, um, especially climate mobility. So what we do know is that the IPCC states with high confidence that nature-based solutions offer a portfolio of effective adaptation measures to reduce climate risk to people, biodiversity, and ecosystem services, while providing multiple social, environmental, and economic co-benefits. But what does this look like? Well, the assessment acknowledges that there are a large variety of approaches and techniques available for nature-based solutions, and these do differ and they should vary in different contexts globally across urban to rural areas. And um, here on the slide, uh, what I'm showing is some examples of nature-based solutions. It's a figure from Working Group 2 report, Chapter 2, and it, which shows in theory how different nature-based solutions can be integrated and contribute towards climate resilient development. I'll just pull out some examples um, which are given in the assessment which, um, for which there is high confidence in the evidence of them providing climate risk reduction. So maybe you can see if you can spot them in the figure while I go through them. Um, these include urban greening with appropriate vegetation and natural areas for local cooling, protecting and restoring natural river systems, wetlands, and upstream natural ecosystems to reduce risk from flood support water supplies during dry periods and maintain water quality, 
protecting and restoring coastal habitats, including wetlands, to protect against coastal erosion and flooding associated with storms and sea level rise, using ecosystem approaches to fisheries, aquaculture, agricultural diversification, agroforestry, and other agroecological practices to support long-term productivity through a buffering of temperature and rainfall extremes, and lastly, uh, restoring natural fire regimes to decrease the vulnerability of people and ecosystems to increase risk from fire from climate change. Now, in addition to these climate risk reduction benefits associated with adaptation that I've just listed, the IPCC notes that co-benefits are wide ranging and include supporting food security, nutrition, health and well-being, livelihoods and biodiversity, and other ecosystem services, while noting especially pest control, soil health, pollination, and carbon sequestration. Now, importantly, the IPCC finds evidence that potential benefits and avoidance of harm are maximized when nature-based solutions are deployed in the right places with the right approaches and in a way that is appropriate for local social and environmental contexts uh, especially when considering the interlinkages between these systems and the fact that these uh, act as actually coupled systems. Uh, it, is, it is clearly stated in the assessments that not all green schemes can be considered nature-based solutions. This is because in many cases they might not benefit biodiversity and or local people, and when not carefully planned can introduce new risks from inappropriate responses to climate change. The, in, this, in this regard, the IPCC highlights some of the issues with planned mass tree planting green schemes, which prioritize fast growing, sometimes non-native monocultures for climate change mitigation, including the impacts that these can have on local biodiversity, people and ecosystem services, notably water supplies. Saying many projects can fail because they choose the wrong species, wrong plant species, use too few species, or not managed for the long term. So some key themes that can be summarized from the IPCC assessment as being essential to nature-based solutions include inclusive and collective governance, integrating perspectives from different social groups, including local and indigenous peoples, integrating interdisciplinary science with indigenous and local knowledge and practical expertise, being people-centric, recognizing the rights of indigenous peoples, and lastly, considering critically what is appropriate for the climate and conditions at each site. Simply, um, it's important to think about matching the right species to the right location, about the effects on nearby insects, other animals, about the relationships with soil, people, and the changing climate. The emphasis needs to be on long-term quality and not on short-term quantities when it comes to nature-based solutions. The IPC further goes on to highlight that effective and careful planning when it comes to nature-based solutions can help to limit negative equity consequences, such as benefiting wealthy neighborhoods more than poor neighborhoods, or where money ends up in affluent areas for adaptation and, and not in informal settlements. Lastly, implementation uh, needs to be carried out within a context of wider public health planning and this is to prevent any unintended health risks that could come um, into play when increasing natural or vegetated areas near human settlements. So while um, what's quite clear is that um, in the assessment, there's not a, the, the assessment does not make a link explicitly between nature-based solutions and climate mobility or mobility or migration. Uh, but from these findings, it becomes quite clear that nature-based solutions have a critical role in supporting um, those affected by uh, climate, climate mobility. So including those on the move, receiving communities, those choosing to remain in place, as well as those who are unable to move. But to, uh, to harness the potential of nature-based solutions to support those affected uh, by, uh, by climate change, and um, we will need to uh, increase deployment in the right places with the right approaches and in a way that considers local context. So uh, Nick, you can move to the next slide. Yeah, great, thanks. So we need to be uh, deploying nature-based solutions, right places, um, and considering the right context. 
And uh, what we know is that there is evidence that policy interest is, is growing in nature-based solutions. In fact, the IPCC states that 65% of commitments under the Paris Agreement to the UNFCCC indicated ecosystem-orientated visions for adaptation. Despite this, nature-based solutions are still not widely implemented, which you can clearly see from this figure, uh, which comes from Chapter 16 from Working Group, group 2 Assessment Report, um, which is the green line showing nature-based solutions. So there's a long way to go in delivering the full potential of nature-based solutions, and especially in relation to integrating these into wider portfolios of adaptation, including mobility-related adaptation. The IPCC states that an additional 2.5 billion people are protected to be living in urban areas by 2050, with up to 90% of this increase concentrated in regions of Asia and Africa. Here, there's a need for increased understanding of hotspots of nature-based solution potential, considering sending and receiving environments related to potential mobility and climate mobility, and in this regard, for areas with high human dependence on ecosystems, high risk from climate change, and with settlements hosting the most vulnerable people. Globally, um, from the IPCC assessment, we know that more financing is being directed to physical infrastructure than natural and social infrastructure. So we need more finance directed to nature-based solutions alongside social infrastructure, but especially with a focus on investment in settlements hosting the most vulnerable people across urban to rural areas, given the translocal nature of these systems. Nature-based solutions could help economy frameworks achieve decent work, decent economic conditions by sustainably and equitably incorporating ecosystem approaches into circular economies. But we need to start doing this now in the coming decade to reduce risks in time. And it is achievable. I would just like to end by highlighting that the IPCC emphasizes across the chapters and in the final summaries that to reduce risk, we require an integrated approach that acknowledges the interdependence between the climate system, biodiversity, and human societies. Here, it's important to note that on their own, there are limits to what nature-based solutions can achieve for adaptation. They require space for performing their climate risk reduction roles for people in terms of adaptation, so there are some site-specific physical limits that become restrictive to adaptation benefits with increasing levels of warming. Nature-based solutions are themselves vulnerable to climate change impacts, especially above 1.5 degrees of warming. Therefore, to conclude, um, I just want to highlight that the IPCC states that to provide a safe environment for people, both people and nature on this planet, it will be essentially to essential to radically cut greenhouse gas emissions in this decade and continuing while effectively and equitably conserving uh, approximately, and they put a number to this, 30 to 50% of the Earth's land, freshwater and ocean areas, including currently near natural ecosystems. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Um, Holden. This is really uh, going in the direction of some of the questions that have been coming in the chat, not notably about solutions. Uh, so what do we do about all this? Um, and thanks for ending us on, on this note. Um, presenting um, also an approach that we are taking, <clears throat> sorry, with our Africa Climate Mobility Initiative, which is to try to understand what are the hotspots. So where should attention go and how do we formulate responses or solutions that are um, context specific and adapted to the needs of people on the ground. Um, we had extensive consultations last year as part of the Africa Climate Mobility Initiative as part of developing our agenda for action, which you can find on our web platform. And um, one thing that we heard consistently in those consultations what was the problematic nature of top-down approaches. <laughs> and so um, we know we need solutions at scale. Um, and thus the question of how do we link up localized contextualized approaches, facilitate learning across contexts, network, um, as, as we call them change agents. And um, part of that work is actually having you all here today. And I've seen a lot of networking and connecting happening in the chat, which
makes us very happy because that is definitely part of our mission. We want to bring you this information, but we also want to bring you in contact and hopefully um, be able to connect afterwards, after this webinar, to take forward work together. Um, one stream of work that will go forward under the leadership of Dr. Nick Simpson is the Africa Climate Mobility Knowledge Network. Um, so for those of you interested in this, I think we'll um, be happy to include you in that forum um, and keep you informed on, on, of the progress um, in the work. Um, I leave with kind of one central question that I think is, is kind of the entry point for the questions of solutions. And that is really around people's agency in the face of climate risk. I think, how do we strengthen it? How do we support it? And then from there, mobility decisions and options can follow. Um, but there's really this critical kind of quite fundamental question that was raised here. Um, I think all the speakers. Um, we had an excellent panel. We've been asked for the presentations. We will coordinate that and see if we can make those available because there was a lot of dense information shared and it will be useful for people to have access to it afterwards. Um, and as I mentioned, we um, are happy to keep you informed on our further work uh, if you have agreed to receive more information from us in the future. Thank you everybody for making the time and staying over time a little bit. Um, it's a pleasure to have you with us and thanks to our interpreter for bearing with this very dense and technical material. I hope you all have a good rest of your day and we'll see you at one of our upcoming events. Thank you very much. Thanks everyone, goodbye.